Welcome to Ahead of Their Game podcast with the executive chairman and co-owner of Tramia Rovers Football Club, Mark Palios. Do you want to be more ambitious, energetic and enterprising? Then listen on. Well, Mark, thank you so much for talking to us here. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do for listeners that might not know? Um, well, I, I'm the uh, executive chairman and Tramia Rovers and co-owner with my wife. Mm-hmm. So um, I basically uh, run the club, the mm-hmm. football club. Um, I also happen to have a, a non-exec, non-executive directorship with SRR, Frontier Shirt Sponsors, SRR. Um, they import 16% of the UK's crude uh, into the country and they're also pretty key to the government's plans for net zero. Uh, they're about to invest, I think, just over 2 billion US into this area as well. So. Um, a company that makes it will make a big difference. It's also a massive part of the energy transition that we're going to make in this country. But you know, ninety nine percent of my day is spent, my week is spent on on uh, looking after the football club. Wow. And um, what would be your morning routine then? Your typical morning here at Tranmere Rovers? Uh, there isn't a typical morning. Um, I mean, t- today is a day after a game at the weekend when we were unfortunate not to win. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, it's so. I'll, I'll, this morning, I'll have spoken to the guys concerning and recruitment and looking at it, what we've got left in the transfer window in terms of what we can do to upgrade the squad. We've got a great squad at this point in time, but um, you're always looking to upgrade. I mean, you probably hear me say a lot of times, "Better never sleeps," and, and that's one of the things that um, I think that if you can instill into people and into mm. the culture, then um, you, you, I've always said I, I get good people around me. Uh, give them a steer. Uh, you've seen some of the guys who are in here. Good, great people. Give them a steer and let them get on with it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the easiest way to do it because that leverages your own time, leads you to get out and do the things that you want to do to keep moving the things forward. So, um, you know, that was the start of the day. Um, I, I'm talking to you, but in the meantime, uh, I've dealt with the, um, the budget for next year and the financial cash flow, made sure that we're okay to go through the whole year. That isn't just done in the five minutes before I came in to see you. That's a process that's been ongoing and ongoing since um, the turn of this year, mm-hmm. as we plan for the following season and, and so forth and so on. We've just locked in the budget, mm-hmm. but in doing that, I've been, this is where the council comes in and the turnaround piece comes in. I'm trying to lock in that budget and then, um, you saw me talking to the lady who's basically the chief operating officer and with her I'm now saying okay let's, they've had an away day and they said they're going to they're gonna do this, they're going to do that, now I need to nail that down into what the budget says and that will, from that will come people's objectives mm-hmm. so they know what the priorities are for, for themselves and those priorities are linked into what we're going to do uh, during the course of the season, off the park, probably more so than on the park because on the park the agenda is quite simple. Mm-hmm. Okay, and going back to your playing days, um, obviously you played for Tramia Rovers and there's a connection there. But I just wanted to ask you that, you know, how did that all come about? How did that relationship start with Tramia? Um, I'm not sure I can refer to your family, of course, but um, <laughs> uh, your uncle. Yeah, you can, of course you can. Your uncle was one of my best mates, and um, I ended up playing for a team called Junior Olympic, mm-hmm. uh, and your granddad happened to be a coach there. And he was, he was quite influential, I, you know, there is a book I will write at some stage of um, uh, little acts of kindness that helped me through life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were various people around the club at that time that made a difference to me. Um, there was David Bale who sort of founded the club and, and um, he, was, he was just a good guy who, and he, he understood, at the time, I, you know, as I say, I was in care, not many people now, I don't think he even told you, your, your, your uncle. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, actually, your, your granddad was the guy who persuaded me because I'd only been playing football for two years. Mm-hmm. I started when I was fourteen. I was a rugby player at school. I started when I was fourteen, um, and the scout from Tranmere came along and asked me to uh, to go with with John, with, with your uncle. And at the time, and it's still the same today. There's a lot of pressure from your mates, from the guys running the the the. The, the local team who wants you to stay and play with those guys and said look you know you can be a big fish in a small pond effectively yeah. or you can try your luck with a professional club and, you know there was hundreds of guys went through there and very few make it so they'd always say look you know come and stay with us it's not worth it 
<coughs> that didn't happen partly because Dave Bale didn't do that, and partly because um, your granddad was, was actually running that team at that, at that, that time and coaching. And uh, I remember what he actually said to me was, because you know, I was just a kid, I didn't, we didn't have a car, and, and I was immediately thinking, how do I get to train? And <laughs> your uncle said, um, look, you should do it. You should at least have a go at it and try it. Uh, and together with John, and, and he'd sort of pick me up and, and then take me to training and stuff like that. So he was he was, he was quite influential in that. Um, <clears throat> and I just went, I stayed at school because my dad was out of my life by then because uh, he had a stroke when I was 11. So, um, but he, he managed to instill in me that, that sort of, A, I call it an immigrant um, um, view and also a Greek view, which is very much about your education. and. School was pretty easy. I was, I was okay. I was an exam animal, uh, so um, <coughs> it was not hard to do that. Uh, and he insisted. <coughs> so by that time, even though it was out my life, by the time I got to sort of sixteen, yeah. um, I just continued to do my school and do my A levels. Got to got to university, <coughs> and indeed, when I was going to university, there was a chance I was going to become a pro. And what happened was, um, I wanted to become a doctor, but the careers master. Um, literally said to me, the only piece of career advice, because you know, I didn't have the parents around at the time, so uh, my mother never, they did say to me, my last um, parent teachers even, it'd be good if your mother came along at least once, Mark. Um, <laughs> she never did. Um, <laughs> so the only advice I got was, um, it was from the geography teacher who used to inhabit the book room at, at lunchtime, and he said, you've got to go, and, and he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do medicine. He said, well, you might be a pro football, you can't do pro football, and medicine at the same time he said and he flipped the book and literally went oh why don't you do psychology they wear white coats <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ended up doing psychology which ended up being um, a really a really good degree because it put a framework around <clears throat> one of the things that um, I think in life is massively important it put a framework around um, empathy and understanding people Mm -hmm. And in, later in my career, when I was um, a senior partner in London and at PwC, we used to get the best of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was pretty easy to adhere to the principle of got good people around you, give them a steer, give them a head. I had first time passes through the exams, qualified, um, promoted every 18 months, mm -hmm. um, Oxbridge graduates, first class degrees, and they were crawling to get into my unit because I do try and create a, a, an elite feel around the teams that I have. Uh, and we were doing good stuff and it was great but you know, the thing that struck me was that some of them would come in and technically they were brilliant but yeah. you know, IQ was a commodity I can buy IQ but EQ, emotional quotient yeah. you know, we used to say IQ was the order qualifier EQ was the order winner and that's the ability to read the people that you're with to sit in the shoes of the person on the other side of the table and um, you know, that is the way I think that you are successful in life. Because if you look at it, unless you're uh, a superb player, uh, as a footballer or an artist, um, you only have so many hours in the day. Mm. You can charge a premium price for, um, for what you do if you, you are one of these people, a great violinist or whatever. But actually, if you're not, then there's only so many hours in the day. And there's only so much you can actually charge for those hours up to a point. Mm -hmm. So you've got to work through people at the end of the day. You've got to leverage yourself up through people. You've got to have teams. You've got to be able to run teams, understand teams, work teams. And, and that really is, uh, is what, what makes EQ, makes you successful, I think, in life. Well, just, I'm very curious then. So emotional, we work a lot with emotional intelligence um, in the language teaching, um, you know, schools and areas, education. What do clubs do for that in terms of, you know, not just preparing the players and staff for matches and and things like that, but the actual behind the scenes of emotional intelligence and making their mind right for the matches, especially the players, do they get? Yeah, the, the, the sports psychologists, and, you know, I'll be blunt about it, sports psychologists are um, at a luxury at our level, but also a danger. Um, I don't think... It's a, 
you know, I'll be criticised for this. We have Liverpool John Moores University just through the tunnel, which is one of the top 10 sports science universities in the world. And we have a great relationship with them and we work with them on everything that we do. So our sports science is top notch mm -hmm. within this, especially for a lower league club. Um, but even though I'm a psychologist uh, by training originally, and I used to, uh, when I was training as a footballer, I'd go and work in the afternoons in the clinical psychology department of a hospital and do behaviour therapy and, and stuff like this. So um, I do understand it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I did some work on the sports psychology um, MSc, but, uh, and that was in the 70s when it was pretty rudimentary. But when they come uh, here, that they apply, but there's a danger down the lower leagues especially, and that is that um, you undermine the relationship between the manager and the players. Mm -hmm. I know, so uh, look, it, being blunt about it, football is full of great people, but it's also full of people who have had a very sort of self-centered existence. You know, you grow up, mm -hmm. you're five years of age, you're the apple of your father's eye because you can play football. You go to school, you're the apple of your teacher's eye because you can play football. You get to be a teenager and you're with a pro club, so all your mates look up to you. You get a contract, there's thousands of fans want to know you, you take selfies and stuff like this. Um, so by the time you get to 35, you, you know, you're, you're a pretty sort of, um, unless you're a very, very strong character, you know, there is this element to it. And that's why a lot of people have a problem with Justin coming out of the game. But then roll that back into what you just asked me. I've got a group of players in a dressing room mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, if you're out the team, you take it very personally because it's a very personal thing because it's very public. Yeah. You know, it's almost like saying you're a warehouseman but you're being dropped down into doing the beer toilet cleaner mm -hmm. because you can't be a good warehouseman but it's actually public. Everybody knows that when you walk mm -hmm. into a pub. You know, so that's one of the things you've got to look at. Um, so if you bring psychologists in um, into that atmosphere, it, it's, it's too febrile. You know, you, you could be an individual who is a paradigm shifter, I call it. Yeah. You've got a view of the world, you've got these are the facts that are happening, so you, you change it until it matches. And people are excuse merchants, so people don't accept that they've just had a bad game. People don't accept that they don't play forwards and stuff like this like they should do. Mm. There's lots more data comes in now, so it's harder to refute this, but the reality is that you know, you can actually cause a problem because I'm a psychologist talking to you and the manager's trying to get you to do something or you're relating to me all the time and you break the bonds in, in the dressing room. Yeah. You know, um, and that's what I'd be concerned about. So it's not something that, that can happen. Uh, it still tends to be a little, at lower levels, it still tends to be a little bit more about um, the manager running that dressing room. And therein lies part of the problem with football because um, if I'm looking at it as business, I have a manager who, um, and, I, and I do a value chain on it, I'm sorry I bore you to death with this for your podcast, but <laughs> no, no, it's um, really interesting. there are three processes in a football club. You can look at any business and you can usually strip it down to the key processes and what, are, and, and what, what is the value chain, where does the value come in, how is it? And if I looked at it from a lower league club in particular, there are three processes. There's recruitment, mm -hmm. there's development, and then there's management. And management isn't just the manager, it's all the sports science that goes around that, all the management of the, of, the, of the squad during the course of the week that gets them out onto the pitch, gets them fit, keeps them at the premium, at the, the, the top level that they can. Mm -hmm. Recruitment is 75, is 70% 70 of the value. Is it 70, is it 69, is it 50? Is it, it's a big part of the value. You get your recruitment on, doesn't matter what you do, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> Development, massively important for a club like us, not so much for the Newcastles and the Man Cities, because they can just buy it in. Yeah. But for a lot of the clubs in the pyramid, it's development that's important. I'd say 20% of the value is that. Okay. If you then look at management, not just the manager, uh, I, I say that's plus or minus 10%. I think the manager can fiddle with the squad, trying to be too clever, can downgrade it, can destroy the relationship with the fans, creates an atmosphere out there that makes it difficult to be successful. And, you know, the LMA not, may not agree with that, but, 
you know, I think most of the managers do on the basis they know that if they can recruit Messi, they can win the league. Yeah. Then you have at the end of that value chain uh, a really interesting difficulty with the industry because you have a very short-term environment. So the alignment I was talking about previously with the staff and the budgets and that, you can't get alignment necessarily with the manager. Yeah, he wants to be successful, but actually if you want to develop players as part of your business model, there's a tension between the two. Mm -hmm. How can you develop and win games at the same time? And actually, the managers in the league, by and large, have this hermetically sealed bubble, which is called the first team environment. And what's fatal in that is group speak. So the manager says it's raining outside, and the assistant manager looks outside, it's sunny, and he goes, it's raining outside. And the reason he does that is because historically in the game in this country, people have always been worried about people making an assistant manager or a manager and so forth. So there's been this way of protecting their back with their own people. Yeah. And you've got to break that down for the benefit of the business. And that's what we've been trying to do here. So that we've now got a, a, a group of people that when the manager goes, they'll stay. And so the processes stay the same. They're not, it's not all thrown out. And actually, if you then look at it, um, what an industry, we have, um, we have a single point of failure. I like a single point of accountability, but we have a single point of failure in this industry, in the manager. He stands outside in the box out there, and actually what happens is that um, if we lose or whatever, the fans get on him and, and so forth. So then take that to me, I've got to then look at recruiting a manager. So I recruit from a pool of failures, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because there's nobody, if I want an experienced manager, he's a failure by definition. In League Two, he must have failed somewhere else. He isn't going to be a successful manager <laughs> coming down to League Two. So, so how do you get around it? Well, actually, there has been a change in as much that a lot of younger coaches are coming through now. And I can mm -hmm. see that and, 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 and understand why that is a benefit to the game. But then if you're taking them, you bring them on, you've immediately got the fans, you've got to create an environment that protects the younger manager coming through because otherwise he'll get chewed up in, you know, in my day, you used to get 18 months as a manager. Nowadays, you get three or four games. If you lose three or four games, the social media pressure is such mm. that, you know, people go, I, I try to avoid it, I don't love social media. <laughs> I, I just ignore it. Yeah. Because it, I, I think that's anti-social media, I call it. Uh, and it's a pressure that you don't need. It's a platform for, um, it's a platform for people who have opinions. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but whether you value it is another matter. And it's more about them than the club, in most cases, because the, I think the silent majority get it right. Because when you speak to them, you know they know exactly what yeah. you are. Um, so. It's quite an interesting industry. I'm not sure that's what you sounds. Mean. No, it sounds fascinating, and I just wanted to link in uh, you, your playing days as a player. What were your strengths, and do you think by having those strengths as a player makes you a good chairman? You know, to have that experience behind you. I think mate, having the experience is right. I mean, I, I um, my business career, I uh, probably went into nearly thirty businesses a year for thirty five years. Mm. Uh, so that's nearly a thousand businesses. That's more, <laughs> but. It's around about a thousand businesses, and and what I did was to develop. I was first of all I did insolvency work, which is good because it's not just the analysis beforehand; it's actually running businesses, and so got the best of both worlds, both in terms of being an accountant that could look at forecasts and, and do the things that accountants do, um, but also was running businesses. So I was doing deals, I was selling businesses, I was getting workforces coalesced around you know what we were trying to do in difficult circumstances in resource constrained conditions you haven't got the time the people or the money so what you have to have is an absolute focus on your priorities i was talking earlier about you know aligning people's priorities with the with the budget and the business mm -hmm. plan and massively important to understand your priorities in life if you don't understand your priorities I'll tell you something, and now I'm going to tell me I'm okay. about the four Fs. If you don't understand your priorities, um, in, in, a, in a benign business environment, you make less profits and people probably don't notice. But in a turnaround, in a difficult situation, uh, in an insolvency situation, if you don't focus on your priorities, you die. Mm. Your business dies. So it's it just, you know, if you work in that environment all your life, um, then you get focused on priorities. So, um, coming to uh, 
coming to here, uh, there were a variety of things that we needed to do. Um, but it is about prioritising. Would you, would you see it, as you said before, a paradigm shift? Is that one of the main things you feel that you wanted to do from the start here is to make things more streamlined, make things how you want it to be because of the, you know, the experiences you've had? as a football club. Yeah, I, I think, I, I'm sorry, I lost my track. Sorry. Um, but, but no, not, that was my fault. Um, yeah, so in, in, when I was looking at businesses, I, I, was, I used to say, I, I'm not an industry expert. I'm a situation expert. Mm -hmm. So the companies in the cart, um, I deal with the situation. It doesn't matter what the industry is. I can pull in industry experts. You know, in PwC, I could pull in I don't know, steel. I did coal and steel twice and so forth. So, but you can pull in the industry experts. It's the situation I deal with. So I was basically industry agnostic. It didn't matter to me what the industry was. Yes, of course, I, you know, you get a reputation doing stuff so in the motor industry or in professional services practices and I did things like that. But when I came here, this is the first industry I knew from being on the tools. Because I'd actually been down there as a player and played over 400 games in the League and Cup. You know, so I know what's going on on the ground. And interestingly, if I went into a, an engineering business, I'd expect an engineer on the board, somebody with the technical skills on the board. If you go to a football business, you haven't got that. Mm. The trying for directors of football and sporting directors, but you haven't really got it on the board. There's no such thing as a consistent um, career path as a sporting director. It's different whichever clubs you go to, even though they're trying to do it. So the manager, and, and it still happens at the top end, you know, they then dictate what they're doing. They still have these fights with the board. Here, what used to happen was you'd appoint a manager, you give them the keys to the sweetie team for 18 months. And I remember thinking this when I was you know, 21, 22, 23. With just the same phraseology I was using in my head. You give them the keys to the sweetie team. Then after 18 months, you make one executive decision. You probably tighten up the keys to the sweetie team, which is counterproductive because you're actually making it harder. Uh, and then you sack him. That's the only exec I remember thinking that's the only executive decision the board take. And whereas it's a different business, you're working with the technical guys there, and because there's nobody with the technical expertise on the board, you know, I, I used to be in the dressing room, and the chairman used to come down and say, uh, "All the best guys," you know, and the manager would go, "Thanks, Mr. Chairman." Go on, go on. And go, what does he know? And and there was that division between the boardroom and the boot room. Here, I, I do, I can transcend it, but equally. Um, I don't, in terms of, I don't go down in the dressing room. I don't give them the chance for them mm. to shut the door on me to say that. But what I do do is I, I you know, I'm happy to, you know, look to the game separately. I know exactly what was wrong separately. And mm. I would tell the manager. And, you know, I, I sat around the table um, recently with um, you know, Nigel Adkins. Um, he was a goalkeeper here when I was here. Um, Steve Beck, who played for England as a young lad, but mm. never really played. Um, he, got, he got injured. Good player got injured. Um, he adores. And, you know, we're talking about the midfield. Well, I've played more than midfield games than them. I know it, I can see it, I can feel it. The issue is you've got to um, deliver that in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't say, you know, this is what your team's going to be, yeah. and this is what your players are going to be. Uh, and there I come back to the EQ element and what we tried to build is a much more um, collaborative style rather than the group speak I was talking about. So if the manager thinks this and the assistant manager doesn't or the head coach doesn't or Nigel who I brought in as a, a director of football, technical director, or, or I don't, then we'll say it. Yeah. And I'll actually say it last <laughs> because I want to have my say, but I don't want to change it to speak. So um, it, it, it's it's um, it does does my career help? Yes, it does because um, I can talk and I can see and I know exactly what's going on there. And yeah, I can see how, I can see when players um, hide and don't want the ball because you know, I've been there trying to find a player on the pitch when you're one 0 down at home. Mm. He's just there and you can't get him. Whereas when you're three nil up, he's there. It's an easy pass. He wants it. You know, so that's the first thing I look for in a player. I can see it when they jib out of a tackle and stuff like that. And I'm, you know, I'm not yeah. afraid to tell them. Um, 
so it, it does help um, it gives you credence but I think you've also got to um, be careful that you don't overstep the mark because you are the chairman because you do make decisions as to whether somebody's going to be um, sacked or not sacked etc uh, and, and I think the key thing for me is to create the optimal atmosphere situation for the managers to succeed yeah. and, and that means things like you know if he's a young manager to try and give him more than the three four five ten games that he'll get from the crowd and that you know you have to you have to sort of work on them in terms of their media i do a lot of media work so i'm quite comfortable with that but you know i've had to work on managers because i've seen managers destroy themselves by the way in which they dealt with the media and the fans um, so yes it, it, it is it is useful um, and without a doubt both in terms of credibility uh, with the guys in there but also in an ability to manage the technical side mm -hmm. and as i say um, there's not a lot of clubs that's what I was always thinking is that you know how many clubs I mean I haven't looked at it but has got that type of you know um, persona in that role it must be quite very very few and well, so it, it's, it's having the influence as well mm. you know so I get the influence because I own the club yeah um, but I think you've got to get beyond that at times and, and, and have it because you you have the um, you, you have the experience that people understand you will deploy correctly what was that story about the four refs? I've got to get you on that one. The four Fs. Oh, the four Fs. Oh, those are four refs. No, yeah, it's much <laughs> called effect, my mistake. That's called the effect of the effect of set on perceptance. And you see what you expect to see, and you hear what you expect to hear. Um, a long time. You asked me a, a, a long time ago. Um, I decided. Well, when I was in psychology, if you look at your life as a, as a circle, mm. um, and it's a and you look at bits of your life and what's the piece of the pie well you know i think for most uh, young males in those days now probably young females as well you know when you get to like 25 to 45 the biggest piece of the pie comes out as your work your job so now if i was to get and that by definition is a compulsion if it takes up too much of your life mm -hmm. okay so if i said just divide your life into four sectors equal quadrants and tell me what they'd be and if I went round the room they might call them different things but essentially you come back to four things I think okay. I call them four refs because I, I like the iteration but actually um, I feel a bit silly now saying refs but anyway <laughs> yeah, F1 F1 okay fitness and health mm -hmm. without your fitness yeah. and health it's your platform you can't do anything so that's F1. These aren't in order, by the way, in terms of importance. They are actually good. Mm. F2 is family and friends. Not just family, family and friends. Right. F3 is, I call it financial. So it's your job, it's mm -hmm. whatever. But for me, it was important to define it as financial independence. I mm. could have carried on working in the city. I could have carried on doing this and the other. But it was never about the money per se, it was about getting to the position whereby I didn't have to worry about it, mm. but if I didn't want to work for you, I wouldn't. You know, I, I was independent. You know, so I, well, even though I went into the profession, if you told me I was going to be an accountant, A, I didn't know they existed. <laughs> I didn't, I was a working class lad. You know, yeah. lawyers, teachers, you know, um, doctors, dentists. Accountants, who were they? I didn't have a clue. That was on another story. That was when I was in, on, on a pre-season tour, a close-season tour in uh, Yugoslavia, when it was called Yugoslavia. It was introduced to me as something I might want to look at. So financial independence, mm -hmm. or finance, finance, your job, whatever, your career. And as I say, for most people that I knew, certainly professionals, that was taking them so much of the pie, it would squeeze your family and friends. It even squeeze your fitness. You, know, you wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't go to the gym. People wouldn't go to the gym in my day. And... Number four, you can guess about. I don't know. <laughs> fun. Make sure you have fun. Yeah. And that, that's fine. I'd say that. And I could probably get the whole of the room to agree. Yeah, they wouldn't disagree. They're pretty broad generals. But then the trick was to how do you make that happen? And yeah. this is where people look at me and say, you're strange on the basis. I used to keep a diary. 
And the diary wasn't about, um, went to the shops today, the, this, the, mm. um, and I, I use the diary in different ways at, t at different times in my life, depending on what, what the situation was. But I consistently, and although I don't do it now, I think I've tried it a couple of times when things have got a bit rocky, but I don't do it now, but because I'm so conditioned into this way of thinking that I don't even have to think about it. But I used to say I could only ever score five in each one of these quadrants. I could never score more than five. And so I was trying to get as close to 20 every day. So at the end of every day, I took my scores on the left one. What did I do? Mm. Well, at the time, why did I put the ballot? You know, I could have scored 10 on fitness. And I was a pro footballer. This is daily? Or we, how daily. would you? Daily. Wow. Daily, daily, daily. And and so I'd go, I could get 10 as a foot because I was training yeah. every day. And I'd gone part time when everybody else was full time. And and so uh, when I was doing my exams, and I um, I used to go, okay, it, and I, you've got to be honest with yourself. Had I really done as much as I could do, and I could only ever get five, I mm. couldn't get 10, I couldn't get 15. So I had to score on the others to make it happen. And then I'd go, um, f family and friends. In those days, I had to write a letter to keep in touch, <laughs> or I had to ring yeah. on a phone. And, it, and it's, you know, so I made myself do it. And then, um, again, my other default was work. So I was working as a chartered accountant. And you know, so it wasn't hard to do that. Mm. But what I did do is I could walk out the office at five o'clock and say goodbye to everybody who's climbing up the greasy pole because I was going to train because I needed to train because I was playing against full-time pros. I was the only part-time pro in the league in those days. And then fun. Well, it happens that, you know, because of the job I was doing at the time, you know, there was a lot of fun around, there was a lot of social life. I didn't really have to work too hard on that. Uh, although, and then what would happen is, by the end of the month, I'd toss it all up, and I'd know, hey, I really haven't been doing enough on, on family and friends, yeah. and so forth. And so the next month, I'd really push that, and so forth. Now, that seems desperately mechanical, but... At the end of the day, it's about conditioning myself. And even today, I know, um, blimey, uh, let me just show you. Priorities, I have priorities. Daily to-dos, weekly to-dos, um, daily priorities. This takes it to technology. But it's technology. almost like, I mean, I do something similar, but it's more, I write that the personal goals, you know, the personal mission statement, which is the underpinning how it's never going to be perfect, but there's at least, you know, family, obviously family coming first. Um, make sure you, do, it's in a different way to that, but that's much more F1, visual. F1, F2, F3, yeah. F4. Yeah. So I, I know exactly what I'm doing today on those things. Yeah. And uh, that, that, and other, other tricks I've got actually changed and um, changed, it shapes my life in the way I approach things. And so I know that why I'm doing something. And it enables you to, to go for a period of time into difficult areas that you don't necessarily want to do. Um, you know, you put it at the bottom of your list. No, it gets to the top of my list because I'll deal with it and, and so forth. So um, it, it's, it's always been a, a feature since I was probably late 20s in terms of doing that so yeah. it's nearly 50 years of doing it and what advice would you give to your younger self you know with all this you know life experience and you obviously worked at the FA and you've held pretty much every position possible and now you're chairman I, 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 I think that um, I'm cognizant of how lucky I am um, And this is a, it's, it's, this isn't fashionable, but I was lucky because I was born in this country. I couldn't be born anywhere. I was born in this country. I was lucky that I was born um, with with a few abilities that, of its time, were important. One was um, I was athletically good. I could do all sports. But, you know, especially football in Merseyside and stuff like that. But, you know, I was blessed with that. Um, and, and that opens so many doors. And it also builds confidence, you know, because you, you, 
people want you. I used to, sometimes in my efforts, I used to say, I used to write things out. You do all the tricks and I'll say, look, what do I want? When I was looking at fitness, I wanted people to still want me on their side. You know, still in my 40s and 50s, I, I wanted people to still want me playing on their father's side too. <laughs> and I, just things like that. Yeah. So it, it was, um, I, I was lucky with, I was blessed with the athletic skills and the sporting skills. I was, you know, so I played around for Cheshire and so forth and played cricket. I was, I was an only bat and a bowler and slip fielder. So I, you know, because Mer on Merseyside they say cricket isn't a scouser's game because there's enough going on. But actually, <laughs> if you're bowling and you're opening bat and you, well, there's always something going on. So I was very lucky in terms of having all those sporting skills. I was very lucky in as much that I was an exam animal. I could just do it. But the key thing that was given to me um, in terms of what I was blessed with uh, was the ability to read people. Mm. And that was, I come back to EQ. It's the one thing that if, you know, if I get my daughters to understand anything, it's to be able to sit on the other side of the table. You know, the people you saw for come in and out, um, you saw a senior guy there, just say, I'll get you a coffee. Yeah. Great guys, great people. Um, and so when, when you, when you, if you come back to it, that's the key skill. You come back to it because you, what I said before, you can't be successful without people, unless you're a fantastic violinist or whatever. Mm. And, and you know, you can't be happy without people. You know, so funny enough, when I got that direction to do psychology as opposed to doing medicine, because I couldn't do medicine physically, um, the psychology degree, it, it, you know, it gives you a framework, that's all. And then it's a framework you can hang your experiences on and see how the things fit together. And if you focused on that anyway, and then if you're playing team games, you know, it's a massive part of playing team games. And I, you know, if, if I had a choice, I mean, I was a director of British Judo. Uh, I love the sport. I think it's um, great in terms of discipline. Um, but it misses out in terms of the real team element that you get. Yeah. You, 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 you've got that when you're in a squad and so forth. but. You miss out on the real team element of, of when you're out there on a pitch in, in one of those team sports. So, you know, get your kids to play team sports, play team sports yourself. But actually, it's that awareness of the individual. Because when I, when, I, when I went into um, the foster home, you know, when I looked at it, um, there is a story, I, I'm not sure I told one, I don't think I did, but. Um, there was a certain brother in St. Anselm's who wasn't the nicest bloke in the world. And I, I um, was in the, uh, the foster home at um, around about Easter. And you used to have to take a bag home with you to get loads of things like bags of sugar, tins of beans for the Easter, the Easter fair. And when I thought about it, Years later, because I never really thought about it in my forties, um, I didn't ask the foster girl to give me um, the stuff to put in the bag because I knew I'd already perceived. While they were nice people, there was no problem with them whatsoever. Uh, it was an economic mm. thing. This they were retired and they got paid for looking after me, so I wasn't going to go and say, "By the way, can you give me all this to take back to school?" When I got back to school. Um, the brother hauled me out to the front of the class and he said, you, Palios, and I remember the words vividly, he said, you're a parasite. You take, 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 and you don't give anything back to the school. And I went back to my desk and I thought, I got away with that. And I thought, I got away with it because I never told anybody I was in care. But the thing that was key was that I also, I understood that this was an economic relationship with these people mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to ask them for the money. So I think having that um, type of insight is massively important. Those two people I spoke to just before, I know exactly what they want to do. I know exactly why they're here and I'm not being clever about it. I just need to know that. If I can fulfill that, then they'll stay and they'll work for me and I come back to it. 
get good people around you, give them a steer, give them a head. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, you know, if, if you um, look at your employees and you say there's a contract and there's a real contract, and I'm not talking about the one that they signed and what they get paid, there's a real contract that they're investing in what they're doing uh, in, in what you're doing. And you've got to make that fit because you spend so many hours in work that if, if you're antagonistic to the aims of the work, it's got to be uncomfortable. Mm. And why would you do it? So you've got to get that alignment uh, all the time. And is that a function of doing psychology or is it just a function of playing a team game? I don't know is the answer. I don't know. I don't, I don't really care. You know, as long as you... You know, you can get that across. And with my girls, I, I think they've got it. You know, mm -hmm. and so I think just in terms of advice to people, um, that's one of the key things to sort of strive for: that understanding of people are working. And it's, it isn't schmaltzy stuff; it's massively pragmatic stuff. If you don't get it right, you know, you make mm -hmm. your life a lot harder. And I say something to them, and that is that um, you should have great expectations of life, but expectations of no one. It's what you do. That's one of the things I liked about your, you know, one of your interviews. You did say that you know it's not what happens to you; it's how you react. And it's so true. It's you know there was a really famous quote. I think it was from a, a Buddha quote: "Is when something bad happens in your life, or something, you know, a death, or something really, you know, really big, then you're you're fed a, a dart, and that dart is an emotional dart, and you have to deal with that one. But there's also a secondary dart, which is something that you can control." And that's the one that, you know, is maybe even more poisonous than the first dart. Um, I just, just make those quotes that make you think, those little stories. I, th I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, I am a great believer in terms of um, it, it isn't what happens to you, it's how you respond that counts. I mean, that is just... And the other side to it is that, you know, I, I, I worked for years in, in crises, they weren't my crises particularly. I mean, I've, I've had a few in my life, but they weren't my crises because they were somebody else's crises. And <clears throat> I suppose because they weren't my crises, you know, you, you get to the point whereby uh, you're always calm. And it's only fairly recently I, I've realised the 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 import of keep calm and carry on or keep calm. But it's right. It's the first thing that happens. I, what I... Um, you, you keep calm. Uh, what I haven't said is, is that I had a double cardiac arrest. And this is, this is a classic word, girl. you keep calm. And uh, I've been playing in, I was 49 and 50, and I was playing in the two counties, cup, semi-final, quarter-final. Um, so I was like the old pro playing. And ball comes over, mull it in, the one they're not. Um, 20 minutes to go, somebody comes, hits me in the chest, causes me to, uh, oh well, we carried on playing. Uh, and I was racing away because my daughters were quite young at the time. I was trying to get back to, to look after them. And uh, so I, I didn't have a shower, the showers were terrible. Dived into my car, drove out of the car park, massive heart attack came on. And I knew what it was because I'd done physiology to a high level. Um, but I was in the middle of nowhere. I didn't know where I was because um, <clears throat> I just followed the lads to this game in, a, in another county mm -hmm. and I knew roughly how to get back and so I, so <clears throat> I'm sitting in the car I'm losing consciousness because I can feel it coming in like this got a massive under here under here down here I knew exactly what it was uh, and I, I, I pulled up at a, at, a, at a crossroads and literally a crossroads and I, I said to myself Mark you're dying and I thought well if I go and get my car my phone out the boot because it was in the boot at the time and I thought I'm going to I'm going to it's going to come on because yeah. I knew it would bring it on and I was losing consciousness and I thought well if I, even if I got it I'd ring them and say I, they'd say where are you I said I don't know and they didn't track your phones in those days <laughs> so I thought well this isn't going to work and you might say it was irresponsible I, I drove out I found a dual gallery which I recognised and I went 80 miles an hour down the outside lane with a finger over the hazard warnings and constantly losing consciousness. And I got myself close enough to the hospital at a place where I knew I could ring my partner that she would know. And um, the ambulance came out and took me in. Rested twice while I was in hospital, having been full of um, um, clock busters. 
And uh, long story, but you know, they basically came to me and said, uh, my father got him at that time said, Mark, they want to bring the girls in to see you. Mm -hmm. And I was going to make it. Um, <clears throat> and I remember thinking at the time, I'm clearly aware that they think I'm not going to make it because it just, it, I saw it flat line twice and I heard the alarms go off. And I remember the nurse, the big tall male nurse, turned around and goes, shit. <laughs> and he, he jump started me yeah. and he burnt all the hairs on my chest and he didn't get the pads on he did it again the second time I remember thinking the first time he did so I burnt all the hairs on his chest and I, and I remember thinking it's a fair deal now I'll settle for that and, but the key thing was you kept calm and I, I think it's a bit of a, <clears throat> a a survival mechanism that you've got but keeping calm was massively important rather than panicking. And that to me is, whenever it hits the fan, you keep calm, you analyze it. I used to say to David Davis, who's a good mate of mine, head of light entertainment at the FA, we used to call him. Um, <laughs> great guy. And, and he used to burst into my office at 10 o'clock every morning with the, the press, which was up here in those days. And, and I said, David, analyzed, I'm dramatized. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was, it was, uh, it's a massive part, I think, of, of, um, of life. So that's something else I'd, I'd say to people. Yeah, you, and the other thing I would say is, and it comes back to this dart you can deal with. Mm. Um, one of the things I do do, if, if you get a confluence of problems, you've got a load of things hitting you, I would draw a box, put the name of the problem on the outside of the box. This is on, on my thing. I put down the one, two or three things you can do on that. Or maybe there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And then when I've done the things, I'll draw the lid on the box and shut it. And then if, there's, if for example, there's something I can't deal with today, I'll just draw the lid on the box. And I segment and compartmentalize problems. And you may look at me. No, no, I'm, I'm fascinated because it's and, stuff that, and, it and, makes sense because you're, you keep referring back to writing things down. And I think by writing things down, you internalize, or yeah, yeah. that's the perception of how I don't know. It, yeah, it, 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 it is. There's other ways in which I, I, I do stuff. But, so, but I know then, I can't deal with this. Forget it. And I do forget it. You know, I can, I fall asleep. Uh, again, you can condition yourself to fall asleep. I know the special forces do it, but you know, it's something I used to do from my psychology days. Uh, and I, uh, Nicky says I can sleep on a bed of nails or stand enough. Okay. <laughs> and even if there's loads of problems, I've always had a, one of the doctors said to me, because he said, well, you know, he was at PwC and he used to go for medicals and he'd say, well, he'd list, he'd, he'd list out first off, when he first met me, he'd list out this, you know, well, there's this, there's that, there's the major, there's that, and he'd go, and he'd, I, I said, how do you deal with that? I said, well, I deal with what I can deal with. Yeah. And if I can't, and I'm honest with myself, that's the thing. As long as you're honest with yourself, it, it's 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 the way to do it. Um, there's one other trick that I have, which I've forgotten now. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you, you talk about writing it down. So I used to go into London, and at the time there were various things. I was I was getting divorced and stuff like this, and I would um, literally get on a train and I, it's, there are three blocks to this. One is I would write down my anger. You try writing down being angry and what you're angry about. You can't write that for more than five minutes, mm -hmm. I'll bet you. You can't do it. Second phase is the six-year-old Mark Pelios test. And I go, when I was six, did I think, and then you, this achievement psychology, I would have done this, I would have done that, I would have done this, I would have done that. That was a bit repetitive because you know, you don't, it's still the same every day, basically. <laughs> and you remind yourself of what you've done and so forth. And then you come to the third piece, which is where I'm doing the, you know, the boxes and saying, this is what I'm going to do. What can I do? And so by the time I get into the office off the train, I knew exactly what I was going to do. And, you know, in the days of faxes before emails, I'd have faxed out what I was going to do on this and that and the other. You know, by 10 o'clock, I dealt with most of the stuff I could do immediately. And, you know, you get on with your day. But that technique of write your anger, you won't take more than five minutes. Like the six-year-old Mark Pelios test, or the Graham Ginelli test, 
right the right what uh, okay so what can I do yeah, yeah. Well, that's really? another technique I use but again you write it down mm -hmm. you get it from here into there right and you know it's, it's other tricks like if you wake up at three o'clock in the morning bad thoughts need company so you'll just get all your bad thoughts so again and you, you need a trigger to um, people will listen to this and say who's talking and don't, don't understand it but believe me it, you know you can do this sort of thing uh, the mind is a very strong tool mm -hmm. well mark it's been an absolute pleasure i really appreciate your time thank you so much for talking to us that's a pleasure give my regards to your uncle your lady, and your mom thank you very much cheers a huge thank you to everybody at Tranmere Rovers Football Club and don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Ahead of Their Game and on YouTube.